Welcome to the Confident Retirement Podcast. How confident are you when it comes to life's biggest money decisions? What is real financial peace and how can you get it? Chris Flaming and Mark Peachy are the founders of LPF Advisors in Sarasota, Florida. They bring together the brightest minds to show you how to have a more confident financial future. They empower listeners with common sense concepts and financial wisdom. And now here are your hosts, LPF Advisors. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to the Confident Retirement Podcast brought to you by LPF Advisors. I'm your host here, as always, Chris Flaming, co-owner of LPF. And just a quick disclaimer, the information we're providing is opinion and not necessarily that of my firm or the platform. It's general education in nature and not any specific customized recommendations or investment advice. For general education purposes, you should be consulting with your own financial tax and legal advisors for specific recommendations on your situation. And I think I covered everything. So today I have the pleasure of welcoming Michael Vader to the show. He is the managing partner of Tickton Law Group, headquartered in Deerfield Beach, Florida. His practice areas include personal injury, business litigation, and more. He has been named a rising star by Super Lawyers for four consecutive years. Michael, thanks for being here and welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. Yeah, let's jump in. So you have kind of an interesting history, an interesting background. Maybe take me through that briefly on what led you to where you are today. Absolutely. So like a lot of people in Florida, I'm a transplant. I wasn't born here. <laughs> I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, I had a mentor in high school who had done his undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he encouraged me to look into going to Notre Dame. Even though I had never visited the school, I sent in an application blindly, got accepted, went on a, a tour and said, hey, this is the place for me. Really uh, was brought in by the sense of community at the school, mm -hmm. ended up uh, going to doing my undergraduate studies there. Then as I was finishing up school, I was looking into law schools. I knew after spending some winters uh, off of Lake Michigan with the 30 mile an hour winds and the wind chill below zero that I wanted to come to a warmer climate, mm -hmm. um, but I'd really not spent much time in the state of Florida. So uh, I blindly uh, applied to University of Florida for law school. I uh, ended up uh, getting accepted, coming down after my acceptance, touring the school and saying, hey, this is definitely a, an amazing school. It's a flagship university in the state. I had an amazing experience at UF Law. And then soon after law school, joined Peter Tickton here at the Tickton Law Group here in Deerfield Beach. And that was back in April of 2010. And I've been here ever since. And I ended up going back during the pandemic to UF and obtained an MBA there. So it's kind of neat in that I have both the legal background and then also the business background, which is very helpful for my clients and a lot different than a lot of lawyers, because a lot of lawyers never, ever get that uh, business background. But business, finance, that's all integral in terms of success with lawsuits and cases and legal situations. Yes, absolutely. And you hinted on this a little bit, but was there a reason or how did you come to choose the area of law that you now focus on primarily? Was that because you associated with Ticton and that was their specialties or was there another reason? Sure. So when I joined the Ticton Law Group, the firm was handling a lot of mortgage foreclosure defense. At one point, the firm represented over 6,000 homeowners in the state of Florida defending their uh, foreclosure claims brought by various banks. And we ended up being very successful in doing that through our uh, aggressive litigation strategies. And after a while, when the uh, number of foreclosure cases decreased, we realized as a firm that we needed to pivot to another area of law uh, because they're simply, with the economy improving, there wasn't as many opportunities to uh, represent homeowners in foreclosure because mm -hmm. no longer were property owners underwater. So one of the areas that seemed like a natural transition, because as a firm, we really enjoy helping the public, is personal injury. And that's been an area of law that I've really grown uh, and expanded in my time here at the firm. And uh, it's been great because we've done personal injury cases all across the state of Florida, from the Keys all the way over to Pensacola and everywhere in between. 
And it's been a really amazing opportunity to take those litigation skills from a de- where previously we were representing defendants and now mm-hmm. switching across the aisle and now representing plaintiffs in these personal injury claims. Okay. So everyone has their own preconceived notion about what attorneys do or what they are, or how they work. So what do you think is probably the biggest misconception that people have about either the profession or specifically about what you do? Sure. I think one of the biggest misconceptions in the practice of law is that a lot of us get educated based upon what we see produced by Hollywood or on TV. And if you're looking at a one hour episode, you're getting all the answers very quickly. You're (laughs) going from the start of a case to a trial within 60 minutes. And what a lot of don't realize is that our legal system is set up where it's very similar to a tennis match where one side will hit the ball across the net and the other side will have to respond and decide where to hit the ball thereafter. And the series of balls being hit and volleyed between one side to the other takes time. Mm -hmm. And I always like to talk to clients initially and say that going through the litigation process is like running a marathon where you have different checkpoints in that process. And in fact, the Florida Supreme Court, which issues guidelines for cases, tells the lawyers, well, you should expect that if you start a lawsuit, it's going to take about 18 months before you can go to trial and have your jury decide your case. Mm -hmm. And that type of timeline is often something that a lot of people don't aren't very familiar with unless you've been in the litigation before and see all these different steps that go into the legal process. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that even got extended further when during after COVID, right? Because there was a backlog and all of that. So I've heard from several people that's even got longer. Absolutely. And in fact, there's been a big push by the Florida Supreme Court to really hold the lawyers' feet to the fire, per se, and make sure that trials that get set don't get continued. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's there's a a change in the what's called the rules of procedure, uh, which goes into effect on January 1st, which states that trial judges are now being instructed under the rules to only grant continuances of trial dates in extreme circumstances or extreme mm. hardships, that the which is a huge switch because it was more routine that if yeah. you had a trial scheduled that your case would get continued. But right, so right now, as you're saying, a lot of cases that are three, four, five years old are still waiting for their trial date because you're right, the court system was unable to impanel juries or do have juries come in during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There was one court in Jacksonville, which actually tried to do a remote trial via Zoom. And following that trial, the trial, the presiding judge says, look, it was just too difficult of an experience. You weren't able to really, because the jurors were on Zoom, the attorneys were on Zoom, and you really need to have everyone come into the courtroom and be able to control the environment, which is what the judge is doing serving basically as an umpire or a referee, making sure that everything's followed in terms of the evidentiary rules and the rules of the court procedure. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, that's nonetheless caused this uh, great backup that's occurred. So I'm curious, like you've had several years of experience in the industry now after joining Ticton. So is there something that now that you wish you knew when you started out? If you could go back in time, maybe talk to the younger Michael, and give him some advice, what might that be? Well, I think one of the things that I've found is, and I'm still learning today, is that you never stop learning. You come out of law school, you come, you take the bar exam, you feel as though everything that you need to know because you're getting good grades, you're passing the bar, but really there's a lot of information that you learn just from experience and just by dealing with certain situations and being able to to use in your repertoire and say, all right, I'm aware of this particular situation that happened in the past, so we need to make sure that we address X, Y, and Z if we find this situation in the future. Mm-hmm. So the idea to never stop learning, this concept of always being willing to learn and absorb new knowledge is something that I highly recommend to new attorneys. And that was something that I had my eyes open to just coming from a classroom setting yeah. to join a law firm. When right. I joined the 
he was the 16th attorney. So luckily I had a lot of mentors and senior attorneys to look up to and ask those questions at the firm, uh, which was very helpful and integral into my own uh, knowledge and edification. Yeah, that mentorship thing can make a huge difference in someone's trajectory and also them getting up to speed. So you mentioned something there, talking about history and with all those cases and learning different things. Is there a specific moment or a case that stands out to you that was particularly influential in shaping the attorney that you are today? Obviously, without going into particulars or specifics. Sure. So I've been involved in some international law cases, and I was once involved in a case that began in Iceland. And the case involved the application of the European Union standards in connection with aviation travel and with Iceland Air. Hmm. And what happened was the case involved someone that was traveling from Iceland to Finland on Iceland Air. And because the pilots had gone on strike in Iceland, what ended up happening was the flight was delayed about 14 hours until they could get replacement pilots. And it ultimately led to other travel complications onward. So the this was an issue of first impression in the European Union courts because the courts have a certain regulation that says that airlines are responsible for delays of a certain uh, amount of time in which the airline has control over that delay. So for example, if their aircraft breaks down and they need to f- repair the aircraft sure. uh, and delay, then the passenger is entitled to a uh, certain compensation from the airline. But there are other types of delays, such as a weather delay, which is outside the control of the airline. So we had made an initial demand to Iceland Air saying, you know, we this was a situation where your own pilots went on strike. We believe our client's entitled to this type of compensation. And Iceland Air rejected our contention. So our next step was to go to the courts of the European Union and bring a case against Iceland Air related to the compensation uh, in this issue. Mm. And it really was an issue of first impression because, yes, it's the pilots, but the pilots themselves decided to go on strike. It wasn't as though the airline had control over the pilots going on strike, which was the art of Iceland Air. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, at the end of the case, we ended up winning. And uh, we got the decision both... uh, in English and then in the Icelandic language, because that was the uh, language of the country of origin. And for me, that was a a very memorable, uh, fun case to do, uh, because it really looked at, it showed me about how to look at issues from different perspectives in an international setting. Mm. Because in Europe, it's much more common to have labor disputes. I think in France, the joke is that there's someone always on strike in France. Right. So it's a whole different perspective than we might see here in the U.S. So in that particular scenario, it it just helped to really expand my own knowledge and also help to me to evaluate situations from different perspectives because someone that's a customer may say, well, this is clearly within the bounds of the airline had control over the situation. But then looking at what issues were raised by Iceland Air in terms of the union and the, the rights on the control that Iceland Air had over the union. Okay. So I want to thank you. I want to switch gears just a little bit, Michael. Maybe describe what you consider to be an ideal client for you. Someone sure. that you either enjoy working with, or if you could paint a picture of an ideal client, who would that be? Sure. So an ideal client is someone that has a vested interest in their case, someone that's uh, interested in the outcome, someone that is engaged. Yes, we're lawyers and we do a lot of the heavy lifting, but the clients are an integral part in terms of a successful case. Throughout the case, there are different opportunities where a client has direct involvement, whether that's through answering questions through a discovery process that are posed by the other side or assisting and providing documents to us, or even being able to 
answer questions in a deposition, which is where the other side gets the opportunity to ask questions live to the client under oath. Mm -hmm. So having a client that's engaged in this process is very helpful. Someone that's able to be available and communicate with us as the attorneys. We handle a lot of different types of cases here, but as you mentioned, a lot of personal injury cases. Having those clients available and interested is definitely something that's very helpful for us as attorneys, especially in those types of cases, because we realize that being in a lawsuit is not a fun situation. Yeah. And being in a lawsuit is something that's very foreign to most people. It's not common that people are going through the, living their life where they're going from lawsuit to lawsuit. Most It's most common for our clients that this is the first time they're ever having any experience with yeah. the courts. Yeah. So then I guess along those lines, what could people expect when they work with you? So talk maybe a little bit about your process. And then I also noticed that you adhere to this concept called the three C's, which was on your website. So maybe talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. So every company that's successful has a certain set of core values and principles. And we have a set of core values and principles uh, in what we do. And for us, it forms the really the guidance in terms of what are the guardrails and what are the parameters involved in our scope of representation and how we work with a client. And when we do that, we look at, we really form a foundation on what you alluded to, which is the three C's. C number one is communication. That's absolutely essential. We, our systems are set up where we have instantaneous communication. Every time we file a document or we receive a document, our digital file system is set up where it instantaneously sends an email to the client with a copy of that document. So that's a really, it's really great to have that level of communication where clients are getting notified and getting to see in real time what's happening in the case. Mm -hmm. Also, communication between the attorney and the client is absolutely critical. When a client chooses to hire our firm, they get assigned to a lead attorney right away. They're not just assigned to a case manager or a paralegal. They get that dedicated attorney and we have someone that's able to answer the phone here 24-7 and get in touch with the attorneys to be able to communicate and make sure that communication is being handled. Our second C is creativity. We realize that in a lawsuit, you go from point A to point Z. And along the way, there are often different challenges or different adventures that you have to go through. What's been great about my job here is I've never had the same day twice. Every day brings its own challenges and adventures, and I'm dealing with different nuances with cases or clients. And with that, I realize that I often have to deviate from my original plan in order to get to the success on our behalf of the client. So having that creativity and thinking outside the box is something that's that we bring to the table and that our clients should expect from us. And lastly, we're cost effective. Cost effectiveness is something that's very helpful in terms of making sure that we maximize the return for our client. Mm. So an example of us being cost effective is we may take a deposition, but it may not be necessary to order that transcript of that witness until we get later on in the case if the case doesn't settle and it goes to trial. By holding off on paying for the transcription of that deposition transcript, we're saving costs for our client that they may not have to incur. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to put our clients in the best possible position. And what we do is everything we can to maximize the return that our clients are getting in their cases. Mm. Okay. So then we I want to shift gears again. You and I were talking a little bit about this, Michael, before we came online. Maybe share with the uh, audience how a personal injury can have a long-term financial impact on a client that on clients that you work with. Sure. In many of the personal injury cases, we've been able to get quite a significant return for our clients. And it's really a life-changing experience for the client. And one of the things that's really critical and we recommend to clients is to work with financial advisors, to work with people that are able to set up settlement fund vehicles 
to be able to come up with some sort of plan where your money is not just sitting in an account, but your money is actually doing something for you. Mm. Uh, we find that oftentimes a case settlement is so large that it can have an, an impact on someone for the next 15, 20, 30 years. And with the rate of inflation and the rate of buying power, what ends up happening is if that money just sits uh, idly in an account, you're actually losing value related to that money because the cost of goods, the inflation mm -hmm. is exceeding what that money is ultimately worth. So it's sitting there, but you're actually losing value. We call so it we... losing money safely. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's like the idea of keeping your money under the mattress. Yeah. You know where it is, but it's not doing anything for you. Right. So one of the things that we've seen lately is a lot of these investment vehicles that are being set up that allow clients to earn a return on this money. And by being able to earn a return, they can be set up in different manners. I've seen some that are set up like annuities where mm -hmm. a client can get a fixed return every so often. I've seen other avenues that are set up that a lot that are basically like a retirement type account that allow for back benefits where you're not getting taxed on the monies and you're able to basically draw off those from those accounts. So the good news is that there's a wide range of settlement vehicles that are out there for personal injury clients. And what I'm seeing as well is I work with clients that are both adults and children, and there are separate vehicles and separate situations involving the courts in whether you're representing an adult or a child. Mm -hmm. So I'd be happy to speak a little bit more about that if that would be helpful to your yeah, listeners. Yeah, go ahead. That's the what he, we're talking about there is the distinction between a minor and an adult and the rules around what can be established for a, an adult person and a minor um, because of their inability due to age of not being able to manage their own affairs. Right. So one of the things, and I'm dealing with a couple of these cases right now, is that if a minor receives a certain settlement amount in the state of Florida, usually it's above $50,000. What happens is it requires the court to appoint a third party. Mm -hmm. And that third party is called an, a guardian at litem to help review the settlement and make sure that the best interests of the child are being kept in place. What the courts also require is that the parents work with a third party more, most frequently, be, along with the guardian at light, someone that's a financial advisor, someone that's able to help put the, the funds into some sort of settlement funds vehicle to ensure that the funds are protected. Because what happens is the child can't access these funds until they turn at least 18. Right. And what also happens is that the money is restricted. So that way the parents or someone else that's caring for the child don't take the child's money. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's the child's money that's mm -hmm. idled to this. And so it goes through a very rigorous court process in which the guardian uh, at litem prepares a report. It goes to the judge. And ultimately, the judge has to sign off on what's going to happen to the funds. Mm -hmm. Yes, that the funds are in the best interest of the child, that the funds are going to be in this particular settlement vehicle, that the funds are going to be utilized for this purpose, that this is going to be the distribution of those funds. So it's a, a really great process that the Florida legislature has set up to help protect minors that are in unfortunate situations that cause them to have to file lawsuits to compensate them for yeah. their loss, whether that's a car crash or whether they've been abused or some other type of, they've been injured in a slip and fall, all those types of situations. Okay. And um, while you were talking, I'm thinking this has got to be an emotional roller coaster for clients. First time that they've done something like this, first time they've been involved in a lawsuit, takes a long time. 
life-changing, could be life-changing for a really long period of time, depending on the nature of their injury. So what do you experience usually as people's biggest fears or concerns when you start working with them? Sure. The biggest fear is the fear of the unknown. Mm. While we as attorneys have a roadmap in our head in terms of, hey, these are the next steps, this is what's going to happen. There's a lot of fear from clients in terms of what's ultimately going to occur. Now, one of the things that differentiates our firm from a lot of other firms is we come from a litigation mindset, a litigation background. And what we're able to do is as soon as we start a case, we're thinking about how are we going to present this case to a jury at the end of the day? And what we often find is that by being proactive and planning, we're able to envision what's our closing argument going to be right before the jury retires and deliberates. And we have that knowledge base that we can, through our communication with our clients, help to educate them as to this process, Mm. understand the nuances in the law, understand the potential risks and that which is the potential positives and negatives of certain scenarios. Because although we're the attorneys, the anything related to a settlement of a case is the decision of the client and the client alone. The attorneys cannot decide to settle a case for a client. Mm -hmm. It's the client that has that ultimate decision-making authority in terms of whether to accept the settlement or whether to continue on with the litigation. Yeah, right. It has to be, I get that question sometimes when I'm talking about options with clients and they you get through them and they answer all the questions and they said, well, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, wait a second, you're su- supposed to decide. I mean, we can, of course, guide them in that and help them to make a good choice, but sometimes they still ask that question. Okay, so I want to shift gears as we're getting close to end of our session today. I'm curious with the, your business, with Ticton, what do you see as being the biggest opportunity for the firm going forward? future goals of the business, things that you all want to achieve? Sure. I was just having a conversation earlier this week, actually, with uh, Peter Tickton. He's our founder and senior partner. And we were looking at areas in which we want to continue to grow the practice. There's a great opportunity now in the legal field, especially where the legal field is developing use of artificial intelligence, the use of being able to do things more remotely. Mm -hmm. So rather than running to the courthouse on a daily basis, we're able to do our court appearances via the Zoom technology or other types of remote platforms. And we see that the areas of law which continue to grow in the state of Florida continue to be personal injury cases and business litigation cases. Mm. where we can help clients that are involved in complex business situations where there's a lawsuit and there's been a breach of a contract or maybe breach of an agreement. Uh, And then also people that are involved in these types of personal injury accidents. There's been a tremendous growth in the population in the state of Florida. And uh, even though vehicles are getting safer, somehow accidents are still happening. I know just driving down to the office this morning, I only live about 15 minutes away. I came across two major vehicle accidents. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, even though all these safety regulations are up there and we have all these smart concepts in the vehicles, it's still not preventing accidents from occurring. I think a lot of that's due to the population growth. So, Oh, yeah. uh, You pack a bunch of people into an area. And then on top of that, you know, that we were talking about the thing with France earlier, I think the joke in Florida is there's always some kind of roundabout or highway construction that's taking place that's got everybody going into one lane or something. And then the traffic pattern changed over the weekend and nobody knows that until they get out on the road. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think even the state's realizing it because the state's talking about building more limited access highways, especially out in the West Coast, where they wanted uh, a highway to go from southwest Florida all the way up to Tallahassee that kind of runs parallel to I-75. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy the amount of expansion and growth that the state's seeing. Good problems to have. I think they call that progress. 
Yes. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Okay. So Michael, maybe on the flip side of that, what do, what have you viewed as being the biggest challenge or obstacle that the firm wants to overcome? Something they want to get better at or improve upon? I, I think one of the uh, areas in which we see as an opportunity is being able to pivot and adjust to changes in the law. Mm. What's amazing is that the law is very fluid. Every year, the state legislature meets. Usually they meet in the spring. And what they do is say, they sign a, a series of laws that affects everything in the state, whether it's affect changing taxes or yeah. changing legal laws. A perfect example of this was just last year, the state enacted a series of legal reforms to address personal injury cases. And one of the biggest changes was that they limited the, the amount of time that you can file a lawsuit if you're involved in a personal mm -hmm. injury, mm -hmm. where it used to be four years and used to be able to wait till you got all your medical treatment done and wait to all your surgeries and any follow-up surgeries. Well, now it's limited to two years. Mm -hmm. So it's causing a, a situation where people have to be, law firms like ours have to be really on top of things and make sure that even if our client is still getting medical treatment, that we file that lawsuit within the two years from when the accident occurred, or else the courts are going to say you filed too late, you came yeah. too late. Yeah. So those yeah. are things uh, I see as opportunities. Okay. And if people want to learn more about you or about the group, what is the best way to contact you or to find information? Sure. So our website's pretty easy. It's uh, legalbrains.com. That's with an S. So all one word, legalbrains.com. I'm also available. Our office is available by phone. Our number is pretty easy. It's 561-232 and then 42s, 2222. So that one's, so it's pretty easy to get a hold of us either by phone or going to our website. We also have social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, uh, YouTube. So you can see some of our content and we have a very, we have a series of blogs where we write about different legal issues and ways in which people can really help to educate themselves. Because as attorneys, that's a lot of what we do is we help to educate our clients and help to educate the public at large and really help them make good decisions. So. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Listen, Michael, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here with me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a really awesome experience, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about these issues and look forward to helping out your clients or any listeners in the future. Awesome. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the Confident Retirement Podcast brought to you by LPF Advisors, where we are hoping to raise the financial confidence of everyday people one show at a time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Be well. Take care. We'll see you next time. Michael, thanks again. Thanks. You've been listening to the Confident Retirement Podcast with Chris and Mark from LPF Advisors. For more information on them and retiring confidently, please visit lpfadvisors.com. If your ears are pleased and your mind is now at ease, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found. 